the brain has been evolving over the last 3 billion years mm. let's just go and do a deep dive into the brain structure where is your consciousness an important part of neuroplasticity is removing connections we don't need so learning is as important as unlearning there are systems in place which is called ego which make you really proud of who you are a large part of the spiritual journey is to give up ego if you scan a brain of somebody who's been meditating for a long time their brain would appear younger india is the hub of spirituality and meditation yeah. for centuries we yes. originated this concept meditation is detachment of attention from the world yogis who are able to control their own heartbeat their body temperature consciousness combined with knowledge leads to creation krishna is talking to arjun about the love of a woman conflict is the essence of life all of neuroscience or all of evolution has been a fight against shiva imagine a neurologist saying all of neuroscience comes from lord shiva hi my name is karishma mehta and i welcome you to realign the podcast Together we'll explore the fascinating intersection of science, spirituality and wellness. In today's episode, we'll dive into the inner workings of the brain with Dr. Sid Warrior, a neurologist. Dr. Warrior explores the relationship between science and spirituality, how yogis master their bodies, rewiring our brain chemistry, neuroplasticity and the left brain right brain connection. As we decode an organ that's been evolving for the past 3 billion years, the brain, you'll gain clarity actionable knowledge and a deeper connection to the incredible world within your own mind it's time to realign mind body and soul dr sid welcome home thank you <laughs> <laughs> so this is our first one of the first few episodes that we're shooting for realign and uh, couldn't have a better person to speak to me about all the things that i want to talk about related to the brain to neuroscience to yeah. spirituality meditation we go a lot of different places yeah thank you so much for having me lovely space that you have here <laughs> yeah it's more intimate than the studio yeah. space yeah so i'm going to start with uh, a little course that i'm doing right now mm -hmm. it's uh, dr joe dispenza and um, i'm learning a lot about the brain mm -hmm. i'm learning a lot about uh, basically unhinging right like um, breaking the patterns yeah. building new frameworks so before we begin Let's just go and do a deep dive into the brain structure, mm -hmm. and we we'll put up like infographics and pictures okay. so that before we even get into any kind of level two conversation, we have the basics clear. Beautiful. I love that you asked me that. Yeah. Because so much of our discussion stems from anatomy. Yeah. Because even in MBBS, uh, the first subject that we are taught is anatomy. Correct. While you are. at the end of the day you're seeing patients you're addressing real life problems let's not forget that everything eventually stems from basic sciences anatomy physiology biochemistry so i love that you asked me that yeah. the brain has been evolving over the last say 3 billion years mm. like a like a building block on top of each other so it's like there is a spinal cord at the bottom on top of the spinal cord is a brain stem on top of the brain stem is the limbic system on top of that is the neocortex mm. and every layer would have taken say 1 billion years wow to add roughly speaking mm. so each of those layers comes with its own baggage comes with its own history comes with its own likes and dislikes and each of them has their own preferences of how it wants to live mm. So when you look at a human being currently we think that their entire nervous system is one thing but it's actually not there are four different levels all of them struggling for their own supremacy Correct. sort of yeah and each one has a veto power over the other wow so at different points in time you are acting out of a different part of your nervous system and this is why anatomy is important because you have to visualize yeah so nowadays when i think of consciousness the question comes on where is your consciousness where are you placing your where are you placing your consciousness right. because at different points in time you are consciously acting out of a different part of your nervous system hmm. 
Understood. Right. Yeah. So I hope the infographic will show this: yeah. spinal cord, brainstem, limbic, neocortex. Got it. And yeah. what about the different lobes of the brain? And yeah. how do they kind of interact with each other right like uh, there's so much said about i'm left brain and yeah. i'm right brain or your left brain and your right brain right. and um, as i was doing this course the one thing and i've obviously studied about all of these things but the one emphasis was that it's one brain yeah. there's duality in yeah. left and right but the synergy or the the coming together of polarity and duality is where the magic happens absolutely and um, if you could talk about the different components yeah. of the brain structure so left and right is one way to look at it but we can also look at it as front and back so going from front to back there is the frontal lobe which is right behind your forehead there is a parietal lobe which is above your ears there is a temporal lobe which is below yeah. your ears and more inside and there's the occipital lobe which is at the back hmm. now these are arbitrary differences and each of those areas have a different function correct so the occipital lobe is responsible for vision hmm. everything that you see is being analyzed in the occipital lobe the temporal lobe is responsible for memory and hearing hmm. the parietal lobe is responsible for sensing what the body is doing and also it is also responsible for 3d space hmm. so understanding where you are in the environment that the parietal lobe does and the frontal lobe is responsible for planning hmm. so all your future planning calculation and also for motor movements so when you're moving your hands moving your legs that the frontal lobe does correct now all of these different areas have to work together in harmony for you to function hmm. the left and right brain differences are kind of abstract because the left brain does the calculation part and the right brain does the harmony part hmm. so if you have to understand it from the perspective of say a piano the left brain will calculate what the white notes are the black notes are what is c what is c sharp but the right brain is what will connect them all together to form music it makes a melody it okay. makes a melody so you can't say which one is more important for music because the right brain cannot function if the left brain does not identify the notes correct and the left brain cannot create music if the right brain can't put it all together absolutely so that's how the left and right brain work together hmm. so nobody is completely left brain or completely right brain because you need both to create anything but you you're skewed more towards a certain side like mm -hmm. you you spoke about left being the math like doing the calculation yeah. right in layman words what left brain is associated with is that you're more logical and you're more right. structured right. and the right is when you're more emotional when there are more nuanced emotions attached to that side of the brain yeah. so does that is that how it works are people tend to being more left or right or is that a myth so the reason that it is a myth is because the lens with which we view it is skewed i'll give you an example left is responsible for language that's what we are taught in our uh, mbbs initially that left is responsible for language language centers are on the left side of the brain so what does that mean when i am talking to you the words that i'm saying your left brain is understanding what each of those words mean correct and your left brain is figuring out what are the words that you will say in response hmm. but the right brain is responsible for prosody which is the tone in which you say it right so uh, there are patients who have had a right brain injury who understand everything but they cannot understand tone so they can't understand sarcasm oh right and they can't modulate their voice in a way that we are doing right now mm. so even now when we are speaking you can understand that there is a tone to our conversation yeah. Yeah. when do we use a high pitch when do we use a low pitch mm. when do we go soft mm. that is the right brain mm. and you could argue that that is a very important part of language correct so this is how the right and left brain work together now there are definitely people who will be more empathetic or more in control of their tone mm -hmm. and some people who are less some people who are very practical they'll just say something like a robot yeah so you could argue that their left brain is more dominant correct but that is just a lens to look at it it's yeah. not an absolute correct 
it's yeah. just a it's a yardstick yes you can okay. look at it that way yeah. so when we speak about left and right mm. the or even the frontal and the back yeah. of the brain in yeah. a holistic view neuroplasticity comes into a lot of um, significance because how the very many billions of yeah. neurons in our brain speak and connect to one another yeah. is what neuroplasticity is yes if you could i explained it in a very non uh, technical yeah. but let's get into the concept of neuroplasticity and why it's so important to kind of make those new connections yeah. um within the brain structure yeah so neuroplasticity is something that happens all the time you don't have to wish for it to happen or try for it to happen it happens automatically and the best example of this is in children so when children grow up initially they are they have billions of neurons those neurons connect to each other over connections called synapses yeah and there are around 1 trillion synapses mm. but the really cool part of understanding children's brain growth is the brain creates around 10 to 100 times more synapses than it needs why is that because the brain doesn't know how much information does the child need to absorb got it and so there is one point in that child's growth where the brain realizes that oh i have too many synapses now so let me start cutting them hmm and this is a process called pruning okay so like literally pruning literally yeah. pruning okay. so imagine there's a garden yeah. and all the hedges are overgrown so you have to prune it to give it a good shape So that is what happens in the brain, mm. and if that pruning doesn't happen, then there are problems. Okay. The child could have seizures because there are too many synapses connecting. Yeah. So the right amount of pruning is what shapes the child. Mm. This process continues for the rest of your life. Mm. So whenever we talk of neuroplasticity, we usually think of new connections forming, but we forget that an important part of neuroplasticity is removing connections we don't need. So learning is as important as unlearning. That's fantastic. And both of these processes together is what neuroplasticity is. This is so interesting because that's exactly what we talk about when we say patterns and behaviors. Yeah. When um Dr. Joe Dispenza speaks about it, he speaks about you are in a program, which mm -hmm. is that you've learned to some emotional experience in your life has caused this chemical reaction which has fired and wired these neurons and then made this connection and then when you keep revisiting the past your thoughts kind of reinforce that program and hardwire it into your system hmm. this process of unlearning or hmm. kind of removing the connection why is it so difficult and how can you better escalate that process which will help you form those new connections which is effectively linked to new behaviors and new patterns which right. can lead to new experiences right yeah. the reason it's difficult to unlearn is because once you learn something you are attaching it to your core identity so if i know a fact and i say that it's a fact now this becomes a part of my identity especially if i have stood by it or if i've told this to other people or if i've lived by that fact now giving up that fact or changing my mind about it is changing my mind about myself hmm. so anyone who attacks that fact is attacking me so your defense mechanisms kick in you want to reject anyone who questions that fact because now you identify with it so anything that triggers a negative emotion is always personal hmm So the reason that unlearning is difficult is because you are literally trying to change yourself. And there are systems in place that make you which is called ego mm. which make you really proud of who you are or want to hold on to who you are. Which is why a large part of the spiritual journey is to give up ego. Correct. There's no I. There's no I and it's easier said than done. Mm. because as long as there is i as long as there is an ego you are holding on to all the things that you define yourself by mm. which makes unlearning so much harder mm. so that's the crux of it how do you begin to unlearn 
what are some of the tips or something that we can do in our daily life i kind of know the answer but yeah. it would be great if you could elaborate so the way i do it is whenever we read something new whenever we absorb new information it's very tempting to make it about ourselves hmm. to say that i have learned this and therefore i am now so much better correct i am now bigger hmm. i am now more knowledgeable but there we are adding to our own ego and then it becomes very important to us that that knowledge always remain that fact always remain true so if tomorrow somebody else comes and says this is not true then i will feel attacked we need to separate self from knowledge that i am somebody who is independent and this is knowledge about the world that i am absorbing but not identifying with hmm. and this is the biggest challenge that science has tried to solve which is if i believe in something today and tomorrow new evidence comes up that disproves my original hypothesis then now i will believe the second thing without being emotionally attached to the correct. first right correct right and that is so difficult hmm. to sh- to follow the evidence wherever it goes is so difficult hmm. which is why even in scientific studies biases come in and that's why you have things like randomized control trial where uh, double blind studies where you shouldn't know because as soon as you know even a researcher even a scientist will find bias and they will try to manipulate the findings because of what they believe in to match that to match that to match what they believe in correct even if they say they don't want to it's a core human instinct mm. so the way to unlearn is to detach yourself from the from the identi- from identifying with that knowledge correct a second to this is um, obviously meditation which right. is something that has now in very recent times come into the fore in terms of its a necessity yeah. in our everyday life but yeah. actually india is the hub of spirituality and meditation yeah. for centuries we yes. originated this concept yes how does your brain and your brain waves mm. change under meditation and this is again under uh, the context of the most common question that i've been asked or mm-hmm. is asked on meditation is why why meditate why and the second question is how yeah of course so we'll answer the why and then we'll get to the how yeah the reason you have to meditate is because in today's world meditation is an act of rebellion because the world is designed in a way that screams for our attention to get divided amongst a million things and to put it simply meditation is detachment of attention from the world hmm. that's what meditation is at the start so okay. baseline is instead of instead of directing your attention outwards you stop directing your attention outwards now whether you direct it inwards is secondary but at least stop directing your attention outwards for me that is meditation level 1 hmm. level 2 would be to direct it inwards and become more aware of yourself step 3 would be to become aware of yourself at a deeper level which is detachment from self and still being aware hmm. step 3 is difficult because step 3 involves detachment from ego hmm. but even if you can achieve level 1 which is stop paying attention outwards that in itself is such a win correct and from a neuroscience perspective why is it a win is because we don't realize how stressful the world is every day every second there are so many things calling for our attention that we are forever dealing with a sense of being late or not doing something or failing at something all the time we are always afraid that we are failing at something we should have been here we should have done this we should have spoken to this person we should have been better even if we don't say it out loud we are constantly dealing with that pressure and when i say we i mean our body hmm. so our body is constantly 
trying to deal with that sense of not having done something right. Correct. So we are living in a state of chronic stress. The only way to get out of that state of chronic stress is to detach our attention from the outside world mm. and allow our body to calm down. Correct. So that is what meditation does at level one. Mm. It starts calming down. The stress mm. level comes down. And in the brain, there is an area called amygdala, mm. which is responsible for spotting stress, spotting okay. threats. Correct. So if you meditate for around half an hour and you put that person in a scanner, a functional MRI, you will find that the amygdala activation is reducing. Mm. So you're literally going from a state of spotting threats everywhere to a state where you're not spotting threats. You're right. more relaxed. Correct. So that is level one. Mm. Itna karo and you will immediately feel the difference. Yeah. Level two is when you start being aware of yourself. There is an area, there's a network called default mode network which is in the innermost part of the brain mm. and that is responsible for being aware of your body default mode network activity changes when you meditate mm. so you gradually become more inwards you become one with yourself correct and finally level three is when your prefrontal cortex activity increases but without threat without amygdala activation Without that stress response. Correct. Yeah. So now you are able to control yourself, hmm. which is a very unique stage where you're able to control your own body and your own thoughts and your own mind without feeling stress. Hmm. And when I read about these yogis who are able to control their own heartbeat, who are able to control their body temperature, I would say that is an ultimate level of control because hmm. you're controlling your own autonomic nervous system which in for most people in the world the autonomic nervous system controls you correct so and it's on autopilot you don't even think about it correct you yeah. can't you can't yeah it's too basic right so at the end stage of meditation you are literally reversing the flow of control in your body wow so that is those levels of meditation and does your brain uh, go through any anatomical differences when you're meditating so for example um I keep coming back to Dr. Joe Dispenza because I'm so into that course that mm -hmm. my mindset is kind of there. Mm -hmm. Where brain scan literally reveal what happens to your brain while you're operating normally in your yeah. everyday life. No, no stress, but like you're just going from one activity to another activity, from yeah. one uh, hectic situation to another hectic situation, busy yeah. life syndrome, yeah. to when you're meditating. So can you talk to me a little bit about what happens to your brain activity? Yeah. What happens to the structure? Does Is there anything on structure? So anatomically from the outside, if you do a plain MRI scan, there won't be too much difference. Correct. Uh, although there are studies that show that the rate of atrophy, which is the rate at which your brain is shrinking, is slower if you are meditating for a long time. Hmm. So when you are... Um, we already spoke about the levels of meditation, right? Correct. When you start, when you start off with meditation, mm -hmm. the the changes that happen in level one is the amygdala getting activated lesser. What is interesting is chronic amygdala activation or chronic stress response leads to faster aging of the brain. Mm -hmm. So your brain literally grows older faster. Mm. Because even with age, there's a natural shrinking that happens. Correct. Which is called atrophy. Mm. It's not abnormal. Eventually, the age, the brain of an 80-year-old would not look the same as the brain of a 25-year-old. Yeah. With age, there is shrinking. But how fast does the shrinking happen is determined by multiple things. Mm. So there are, there are genetic factors, which assuming we can't do anything about. But the kind of food that you eat, the kind of stress that you bear on a day-to-day -day life, the kind of quality of sleep that you have, all of these factors will determine how quickly your brain shrinks. Yeah. Meditation is one way that you can slow down that process. Right. Uh, so if you scan a brain of somebody who's been meditating for a long time, their brain would appear younger mm. than their contemporaries. Who are just going through life. Correct. On their usual Correct. Motion. And one of the reasons for this is reduced stress. 
right yeah. so it ultimately boils down to the concepts of stress versus being mindful or being conscious of the fact that you're kind of detaching from the stress right like that where yeah you don't let it get to you in that sense Absolutely. because stress will happen like there are things that are out of your control which will happen yeah. it's your reaction to it more so that yeah. determines how stress you are or how you take it in your stride absolutely what is interesting to me is a lot of these findings that neuroscience is coming out with now people have already understood this from an anecdotal sense mm-hmm. centuries ago yeah what is stoicism the ancient greek philosophy of detachment correct that focus on the things you th- that you can control if there are things that you can't control detach mm. essentially that is what even modern day cognitive behavioral therapy talks about that change the way that you look at things change what you uh, change how you react to things that you can't control and learn detachment yeah it's the same thing correct even narrative therapy today talks about that same thing of change the story in which mm-hmm. you know you create how you are going through life meditation in a way does that mm-hmm. meditation allows you at a very fundamental level to detach yourself to bring yourself back bring yourself away from your stress right yeah going one step further from there let's talk about two things the first is mental health mm-hmm. because it's so much in conversation now right yeah. where mental health awareness and it's a great movement because finally people are aware that this is something to be taken seriously yeah and it's not just negative like when i'm talking about my mental health it could also be in a, on from a very positive lens True. that this is what i'm doing to feed it to yeah. to nourish it um how is mental health um association or mental health um in a negative way like mm. mental health issues mm-hmm. related to the brain activity and what can one do to take care of their mental health mm. the reason why talking about mental health is difficult mm. is because unlike say you take any other disease you say tuberculosis yeah okay most people will not have tuberculosis but they may they will have a risk of tuberculosis especially if they're staying in india uh, but most people will not mental health is something that every single human being goes through because it is the way that your brain is dealing with the stresses that life is throwing at you right everyone feels sad everyone in the world feels anxious now these are human experiences which is not the case with other diseases right nobody has some tuberculosis but then it doesn't you know it's there is a difference yeah. if you are feeling symptoms of tuberculosis you should get it checked correct but the symptoms of mental health actually can seem routine life experiences hmm. this is why it is difficult because people need understanding that mental health is a problem but at the same time they also need to know that feeling sad does not equate with depression feeling anxious does not equate with having an anxiety disorder correct and if awareness turns into over diagnosis you might self diagnose that oh i have anxiety mm-hmm. and therefore i am unable to do this when it may not even be the case it may not be the case yeah. which is why i feel that half knowledge is dangerous every time people talk about mental health they should also talk about the importance of seeking help and the importance of resilience mm. i feel that these three things should always go together and the reason is when we talk only about the mental health problems without talking about the solutions we are actually not empowering the people mm. we are saying that oh it's not your fault it is a mental health problem there's nothing that you can do mm. which is not the message that we want to put out every time we talk about anxiety or depression we should immediately talk about what can you do to solve it 
and what is the importance of building resilience hmm. so that you don't face these issues in the future correct yeah when i think of mental health i think of reserves so every human being has a certain amount of reserve to deal with a certain amount of stress everyone has a limit the most resilient person in the world will have some limit beyond which their brain will stop functioning optimally hmm. the whole purpose of building resilience is to build that reserve so that that lower limit is different correct so right from childhood that importance should be placed on how to build that reserve so that you can deal with more and more stress in a healthy way mm. that is what mental health is for me yeah and whenever you feel that you can't cope with it what are the steps that you can take Right. which could be reaching out for help which is re- taking therapy sometimes it could be medication but most of the times it may not be it it would be uh, cognitive behavioral therapy it could be narrative therapy all of these are techniques in which you can build your resilience hmm. this conversation all these points should be ticked off every time we talk about mental health yeah not just from a skewed lens of like Correct. let me categorize it based as a slight emotion that i feel exactly right right moving to something that is related to the mind um i'm a huge believer of the power of the subconscious mind yeah. by dr joseph murphy and i recommend that book to anybody like it's always in my top 5 recommendations because i think that somewhere it changed my perception about how i am able to operate or yeah. how why are certain things coming from within as opposed to um other things that aren't yeah. right So he effectively talks about two minds: the hmm. conscious mind and your subconscious mind. Right. And um, the subconscious mind is the one that has the controlling power. It has it it has the ability to attract everything into your life that hmm. that you that you could kind of have on your vision vision board or hmm. from that lens. Is that something that you talk about? Is that something that you've studied? the difference between the conscious and the subconscious and how can it be used as a tool yeah most of what your brain does you are not conscious about yeah it's happening so at the subconscious it's level. happening at a yeah it ha- it's happening at a subconscious level um but that doesn't mean that you cannot be conscious correct if your attention is on it gradually you will become conscious of it the example that i gave is of dark adaptation which is uh, suppose if you go from a brightly lit room into a completely dark room initially you will not be able to see anything but you give it time and your eyes adjust so over the next 15 20 minutes 40 minutes some shapes start coming out and after 2 hours you will be able to see the room pretty well yeah because your eyes have now adapted correct um because the rod cells in your retina take time and your body literally takes time to shift from one state to another state hmm. similarly with self consciousness it's not easy to become aware of your own emotions it's not easy to become aware of your subconscious so to speak but you give it time and you give it attention and your body shifts hmm. which is what journaling does yeah when you journal when you start writing you don't know what you will write but if you keep writing you keep writing thoughts will come and awareness will come the things you didn't know half an hour ago now come out on paper mm. where did they come from it's just that you are now paying attention to something that you didn't pay attention to before correct so your subconscious wants to be heard your subconscious wants to come out it's just that we are not allowing it that space mm. i was all i i've been an atheist for a long time mm. but i would never tell somebody to stop believing correct because i know the value of faith i know the value of religion and if something is helping them it's not my role in life to take that belief away from them so if somebody believes in the law of attraction all the more power to them there's nothing wrong in that the other thing is from a neuroscience perspective i also know that your mindset does dictate what you see So if you are an optimistic person you will see more opportunities. Hmm. It's very clear. And if you're a pessimistic person you will see more threats. Yeah. It's as simple as that. So if 
if there are five people in a room and I tell two of them that there is a poisonous snake somewhere in this room and the other three don't know about it, they will have very different experiences of a party. Correct. Those two people will be constantly looking around, right? So that is why the mindset matters. The same conversation, the same food, the same drinks, but those two people will be having a very different experience because their mind is constantly on, is something coming to kill me? Mm. Which is what anxiety does, which is what a negative mindset does. So I know for a fact that mindset matters, uh, positive thinking matters. My issue is that sometimes these things are packaged as a magical pill hmm. and not explained with its proper scientific explanations. Okay. And that gives, a, gives an easy way for people who don't really understand it to sell these things. Correct. So where is the line between scientific fact and quackery? That line gets blurred, especially when, you know, topics like this come up because people need hope. People need to be told how they can live. Um, so there I don't, I don't step in too much. Correct. If if I feel that somebody is doing something that is harmful to them, then I'll explain it. Otherwise, you uh, just, yes, yeah. correct. So how does the concept that is spoken about by say even a Dr. Joe Dispenza yeah. or the premise of The Secret or mm. the premise of Louis Hay, which is all these thought leaders who say that your thoughts have the ability to create your reality. Correct. What is your opinion on this statement? Usually all of these uh, concepts have some basis in neuroscientific truth mm. because without that it wouldn't work. Correct. Right. Uh, but it is packaged with a lot of assumptions that um, don't have evidence. Mm. For example, past life regression. There are enough and more stories mm. of past life regression. But every time any kind of scientific study has gone into trying to prove whether this exists, it has always been proven false. That is on one side. But does that mean that people have not found benefit doing past life regression. No, people have found benefit. Because in a way, past life regression is narrative therapy. Hmm. What does narrative therapy do? Whatever is happening to you, you need to create some story that explains why you are experiencing this. Yeah. Some explanation is better than no explanation. Correct. And if I give you a story that says that in your past life, you experienced this and this is why now you are going through this and here is the path forward, it helps you. Hmm. It gives you something to hold on to. It has actual real life implications that make you live better. Correct. Do I not want that? Of course I want that. I'm glad that your life is better. Yeah. If your life is better because of a fundamental belief that cannot be scientifically proven, so be it. Yeah. So I would never come out and say that, uh, I know that I don't believe in it, but if you believe in it, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. So, but what about the premise of thoughts? All thoughts have a frequency. And then that frequency helps to create a new reality. Because hmm. what what I've been studying is that when you're, when the neurons in your brain learn to fire and wire in different ways and form newer connections, it brings new experiences into your life, which effectively brings out new outcomes, whether it's uh, in a positive way, because mm -hmm. you're disassociating, unlearning from yeah. what you had. Yeah. So how do you how do how does one categorize a thought having a frequency, mm -hmm. and to be mindful of the thoughts that are going through your mind? Because yeah. we think somewhere between fifty to sixty thousand thoughts in a day sure. on average. It's near impossible to micromanage every thought it's Correct. not possible but overall you'll know that i'm more inclined towards positive or i'm more inclined towards negative absolutely which makes you a effectively positive or a negative person right. and and a person who sees opportunity or a person who sees problems sure so how does thought and frequency yeah. have an implication on creating new experiences and building a new reality for yourself so and this is also in intrinsically linked to the mindset, which you were talking correct, about earlier. Correct. Yeah. So that part, I completely agree that um, if you are a positive person, most of your thoughts would be leading towards positive outcomes, um, which is what a growth mindset is. Essentially, 
growth mindset says that um, i fundamentally believe that my hard work will pay off that my opportunity that new opportunities will come that i have the capacity to take up those opportunities and if i see somebody else succeeding i won't be jealous of them i will congratulate them and i will try to learn from them so people are competition but they are not holding me back that i am in charge of my own destiny that is what growth mindset is correct and it does help having a growth mindset means that you will approach life from that perspective you are curious and you will learn faster than others whereas if you have a fixed mindset you will not do that you will feel that this is the best that i can do there's nothing more that can be done fate is against me and i have my limitations and that is it hmm. the difference is real so having a growth mindset means that you will live a better life you will see more opportunities now the issue with frequency is that it cannot be proven first of all um because when you look at an eeg i have done this experiment where i have put an eeg on somebody and i've asked them to think about music i've asked them to think about their mom i've asked them to think about something that makes them really angry and the differences in the waves are too minute to pick so when you say that oh this particular thought made them think uh, made the waves change in a particular way real life implications are so little that i wouldn't put too much focus on that what is far more important is that if thinking about frequencies gives you a framework to go through life do it right and as a scientist this might sound strange but forget about the science if it gives you a framework to live your life better do it it's not harming anybody you are not hurting yourself do it think about frequency think about the frequency in which you are talking to people do it no problem having some framework is better than having no framework correct so that's what i fundamentally believe and if it gives you a structure do it mm. like if you say that fasting is fasting on fridays is good for you because of whatever reason because mercury is here <laughs> sure doesn't matter forget about the science if it gives you a framework to organize your week do it yeah it's better than having no framework at all correct that's how i see it but frequency as a scientific concept uh, for thoughts uh, does not exist right moving into one step further because mm -hmm. these are all in the same universe of sure. subjects which is a uh, manifestation yeah. and visualization which have become very popular terms especially after the secret yeah i personally do visualize yeah. and um i believe that there is a certain energy in seeing your future as yeah. opposed to holding on to some a vision of the past i'd rather build a vision of the future right. with positive intent it's not like i'm going to sit on this couch and being like oh i'm going to run a successful business i'm yeah. actually going to go yeah. to the office and run the business for okay. it to be successful okay. or it's not like you sat on your couch and being like i'm going to become a doctor one day yeah. you have to go you have to put in the work okay. so positive intent or a future intent backed by strong action and i believe that a lot of it in my life at least has manifested yeah. in the sense that things that are seemingly impossible right yeah. like uh, i often tell the story that uh, back in 2016 i had said uh, i really i've always wanted to be on forbes mm. and back in the day my my password would be forbes 2016 <laughs> it, i was very obsessed with the idea of being on forbes since i was like since i first heard what forbes was right and in 2016 april i had an issue in forbes asia wow and i talk about the story a lot because i think that uh, it's one of the many actually um yeah. the different things like i i said this in one of um another podcast where the studio in our office was visualized mm. they'll be like this mm. and it is in blood and flesh right. it is like that it is what we envisioned of yeah. course there were many layers that went through it yeah. but eventually the final outcome was pretty close to what you saw a mental image of correct so what is your opinion on this absolutely agree okay the reason it works is because we make a lot of micro decisions in our lives 
विच वी मे नॉट इवन बी अवेयर ऑफ कि अच्छा आज ये करना है कि ये करना है इससे मिलना है कि नहीं मिलना है वेर डू आई गो फॉर ब्रांच शुड आई स्लीप अर्ली दीज आर ऑल माइक्रो डिसीजन एंड वी थिंक दैट दीज डोंट रियली मैटर बट दे डू सो ऑल आर माइक्रो डिसीजन आर लीडिंग अस इन सम डायरेक्शन नाउ टेक द एग्जाम्पल ऑफ गूगल मैप्स ओके if i i take my car and i just start driving hmm. and i have no idea where i'm going every road has an equal probability of being taken that's also one way to live no problems i will still meet people i will still have some kind of fun i will still have some experiences i'll have a good life but suppose if i put some destination on the map and it's there on the map the blue line is clear in front of me now i have this line and i'm still free to take whatever roads that i want to take but i will find that more and more likely even if i take a left or a right eventually i will take turns that bring me back to that main line correct i don't have to push myself i don't have to force anything just having that goal means that i will more likely take turns that lead me in that direction so i may not have taken a straight line to that end goal but through detours i will reach there so this is like decisions those are micro decisions that are being influenced by a vision that you have set for yourself this is why visualization works because those small decisions of a versus b if a is more likely to lead you to your final goal you will pick a correct even though you were not consciously think that going to sleep early has anything to do with your final goal but it does yeah so it's those micro decisions that are being affected by a strong vision hmm. so absolutely visualization works you spoke about the bhagavad gita and yeah. this is my favorite subject yeah. and it's a dream to be speaking spirituality with a doctor yeah and uh, the one statement that you made which i got stuck on was all of neuroscience is based on shiva i think you've said that somewhere he is um one such god that so many people kind of look to for strength mm. for that for the process of creation and destruction right like i always say after the destruction comes the creation and that is my mindset in a situation where you technically fundamentally at a body level feel destroyed and uh, he's given me a lot of strength yeah um so talk to me about that premise yeah. and then we'll go more into spirituality recently i have evolved a different theory on hindu gods hmm. okay i feel that hinduism as a religion has understood different aspects of life in a very fundamental way and each aspect of life has been personified into a god so creation and destruction are both aspects of life mm. it is constantly happening around us and how does creation and destruction work together can be understood sort of through the stories of mythology mm. so even in uh, even in mythology vishnu has always existed right so whatever is is and then from vishnu's belly button comes uh, a stem and a lotus and inside the lotus is brahma brahma initially brahma doesn't know anything he has no idea and then he hears a voice telling him to meditate which is go inwards and he meditates for eons and finally he gets awareness and then he says aham brahmasmi which is i am brahma which is the beginning of consciousness so that is when consciousness starts and brahma's partner is saraswati which is knowledge so consciousness combined with knowledge leads to creation which is the essence of 
all creation all creation right you cannot create if you don't have consciousness and you cannot create if you don't have knowledge at some level you need knowledge because creation can only happen if knowledge mixes with knowledge to create more so at the genetic level we are passing on knowledge dna is condensed knowledge mm. it is experience collected at the molecular level so from that perspective i love hindu mythology i love how the metaphors talk about such depth shiva wasn't created mm. there was no there's nothing like beginning of shiva because the concept of destruction has always existed it was just that there was nothing to destroy but as soon as creation starts it turns out that shiva was always there and the reason that it is very very important to understand shiva as a concept is we struggle with death inherently anything that is alive struggles against death we don't want to die there's a beautiful book called denial of death uh, by Ern Ernest Becker that explains this very beautifully but he doesn't refer to shiva though mm. uh, i made that connection of how we are struggling against death in everything that we do the reason we doing a podcast is because we don't want to die so that our voices will remain on the internet even after we go our thoughts will remain so that 500 years later somebody might listen to this and think oh there was once upon a time um karishma and siddharth sat and yeah. spoke about things so we want to create and we want to leave a legacy because somewhere we don't want to die this is reflected in everything that we do so understanding shiva is so important because all of neuroscience or all of evolution has been a fight against shiva against death but at the same time coming to terms with death death as the most natural part of life as the most natural part of life as the most inevitable part of life because right. if shiva wasn't there or death wasn't there biology would not exist the way it does today mm. most of our biology is or all of our biology everything in our body every cell is designed because it is going to die so if death wasn't there our entire body would be different right so and at every level at every cell shiva exists or death exists so that's why i feel that as a from a spiritual context it is so important to understand mythology mm. because it does affect us yeah yeah you also made a very interesting reel about the bhagavad gita mm -hmm. and 12 chapters 12 verses mm -hmm. and their meaning in science right yeah. and i find the confluence of science and spirituality is that sweet spot yeah. that the union of duality left yeah. and right because yeah. for me spirituality is all love it's it's where where my heart goes yeah. and science actually gives me method to the madness it's like okay this is also there is logic there's yeah. some kind of backing to it even from science yeah talk to me about the process of um, creating that reel uh, more more so tell us what it was about so i have read the bhagavad gita end to end thrice now okay. um, which version let's put that up the iskon one the iskon but what was interesting was the first two times i read the uh, the interpretation also the last time i read it which was around 3 years ago during the pandemic i didn't read the interpretation I only read the verse and the translation, and I tried to interpret it. So you read the actual shlokas. The actual shloka, and I read the word-to-word -word translation from Sanskrit to, to English, English, put together the meaning, and then I interpreted it. It was done on a live stream on YouTube, eighteen different live streams or eighteen chapters. And initially, I was hesitant, thinking that, who am I? to interpret bhagavad gita but over time i realized that that is a very wrong way to think because bhagavad gita talks about the struggles that each and every human being goes through mm. and so each and every human being has the right and in fact a duty 
to interpret it by themselves it's everyone's everyone right because if you remember the first chapter is the it's about arjuna's conflict mm. right so Ar- 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 arjun is standing there his cousins and everybody is in front of him and he realizes that he is a warrior his duty is to fight but his duty will now make him do things that he doesn't want to do honor integrity or honor correct yeah. identity level yeah, identity level who amongst us hasn't faced this yeah. that conflict 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 is the essence of life yeah every day we wake up and we are conflicted yeah. gym jana hai ki nahi jana hai mm-hmm. you know if you, do you want to go for a run or not every day we face this conflict at different levels so from that point onwards the whole book is teaching you how to deal with conflict and it breaks it down to such beautiful levels it breaks down conflict at its social level at its personal level at a psychological level at a metaphysical level the whole book is on conflict we can rebrand bhagavad gita as the how to deal with conflict correct that's what the bhagavad gita is mm. and it solves it at every level so if you want to do it at a practical level read this chapter mm. but if you want to solve it at a spiritual level read this chapter okay. so i realized that um, it's not for any expert to do it's for all of us and we all have to interpret it from our experience mm. so i interpreted it from the neuroscience perspective okay. and a lot of it made sense when the when there's a verse that talks about how there are two kinds of pleasure there's a sensory pleasure and there is a higher pleasure that's exactly what it is in neuroscience there is the pleasure from the senses and then there is pleasure which is independent of the senses mm. so the pleasure from the senses is your typical dopamine uh, nucleus accumbens network which is what addiction is yeah you eat chocolate you feel happy that is that or you smoke a cigarette or you drink alcohol and you feel happy that is that sensory pleasure and then there's a higher pleasure which comes from attainment of knowledge or attainment of something beyond yourself mm. which is what meditation gives you so these things are neuroscientifically true correct so when i read it i realized that um, these are hard problems of life these problems are not new conflict is not new ever since human beings being a, became conscious of themselves they have felt conflict correct so to ignore something that old that has put in so much thought and effort into solving these problems uh if you don't make use of it we are the fools right so that's why i made that reel that's why i made the uh, whole uh, those live streams i wanted to understand it at my level so what's your favorite verse in the gita and interpret it from a scientific lens for me uh, i can't remember the chapter name uh, that's okay like so a one of, yeah one of the things that um, i really liked was one of the verses described how how should you eat food hmm. and it says you can eat anything but eat it within 3 hours of making it and i felt so surprised because bhagavad gita seemed to me like a very spiritual philosophical book and here it is giving a very practical advice and i actually tried to do that for a month and it was incredible yeah eat whatever you want but eat it within 3 hours of making it mm. which means automatically you will not eat anything packaged yeah you will not make you will not eat anything which is preheated mm. uh you won't eat anything restaurants would be out because they usually make stuff and, and keep, keep it yeah but if it's something that is being made in front of you you can have it and you actually end up feeling much healthier yeah so i really loved that in the midst of all this philosophy and metaphysics <laughs> it gives you such a practical piece of advice yeah. um that really helps you live better yeah uh, so that that was one thing and uh, the other thing was the importance of bhakti that really affected me because one of the things of ego is that we hold on to ourselves and our pride really strongly mm. so the idea of surrender is very difficult surrender is taken as a negative thing mm. right because if you are victorious people will surrender to you so the idea of you surrendering to anything is considered as a loss you've lost you know yeah. but the way bhagavad gita talks about it is that 
there are certain things in there are certain behavior patterns in yourself that you will only unlock after you've surrendered correct and so surrendering becomes an act of bravery because it's not easy to surrender and then you realize that some of the most beautiful things in life you've experienced has come about because you've surrendered whether that's in love if you surrender to a person you stop fighting you stop fighting to be right or you stop fighting to be superior you just surrender for that moment it's it's really beautiful love is really beautiful when you've surrendered uh, when you surrender to a cause when you've surrendered to an act you suddenly become free so there is a lovely irony there where freedom and surrender they are not really opposites they could probably mean the same thing um so i really loved that part i yeah. loved that verse so we've discussed the idea and the concept of surrender in detail mm -hmm. with uh, karishma ooja who mm -hmm. was a phd and she talks about science talks about manifestation yeah. all of those things and the act of surrendering itself is means it means that you've detached from the outcome because you already know somewhere that it's for my best interest yeah. it's in my highest and best interest yeah. and that's it i'm protected and yeah. uh, everything that's happening now is a small version of the larger reality mm. and again i think that that's a by product of uh, so many different concepts which are yeah. in the gita and um, as you go further in life you realize that the sense of protection from something that you don't even know right mm. like you said you're an atheist but mm. you speak about shiva and yeah. you speak about the bhagavad gita it means that on some plane in some level you found also logic there yeah. because it's not directly related to the principles of okay it's a idol worship or you know right. that kind of a philosophy right. how do you explain um, you were saying something so while i am an atheist i do pray oh you do pray okay what do you pray what is your prayer i have two prayers okay which is it's very simple it's that um give me the strength to do what is right and give me the wisdom to know what is wrong in i the lines are in malayalam um because that's that's my mother tongue and yeah. i've grown up with that but the essence of it is um that these are two different things so you instinctively know what is right and wrong but sometimes you don't have the strength to do it correct um and sometimes you feel that if you pray that strength comes more easily mm. even if it's difficult sometimes you've sometimes you want to say the truth mm. or sometimes you've lied and you want to confess to it correct sometimes you want to tell somebody an something that is uncomfortable it takes strength mm -hmm. you can feel that resistance and you want that extra extra strength from somewhere and faith helps mm -hmm. so even if i am an atheist in the conventional sense i have found that praying works who i am praying to does not matter right uh how i am praying does not matter mm -hmm. but faith works and this has it has taken me some time to get to this space where i can be an atheist and still pray yeah and it's taken me a lot of um figuring out where it's like stand. yeah exactly it's like dissecting because yeah. you know you some sometimes the conflict might seem too inherent mm -hmm. but if you go even deeper and you dissect the strands you will understand that oh this is what i believe in and this is not mm. so that's where i am now <laughs> tell me fascinating so um my question was that in this confluence of science and spirituality yeah what is the best way that one can truly live right like to mm. to lead a more holistic life to live with less stress to look after your mental health and your yeah. mental well-being yeah. what are some of the things that you suggest one thing that i would suggest everybody do is to have some rituals 
that they consider as sacred mm. now both of these words have been kind of copyrighted by religion mm. they're trademarked by religion <laughs> right rituals are a religious thing sacred is a religious thing but it doesn't have to be okay assume that you are your religion so even if you're an atheist if you are your own religion you can have rituals that are sacred to you but then you should follow them whatever they may be have rituals that are sacred to you because it gives you a framework to live your life give me an example like for example um connecting with the people that you love so one of my rituals is um i have a couple of friends who i make it a point to meet once in a month for no particular reason but we just meet and over a period of time that has led to so much of peace even if it's just to meet and you have a coffee you sit there for half an hour 45 minutes or an hour and you come back but just having that ritual gives you a framework to look at your whole year mm. because you know that okay next month when are we meeting next month when are we meeting okay. my new ritual is uh, i'll go scuba diving twice a year mm. now there's no reason to make it sacred i could have just kept it that whenever i will get time but now it's a ritual i have to make time for it and so every time i go underwater it brings that peace automatically because now it's a ritual mm. so it's you can literally hear the sound of something clicking into place yeah. so every time you do that you are giving meaning to your life so all meaning is given no meaning is inherent mm. this is what you realize after spending a lot of time in spirituality that if you are an atheist or if you're a cynic mm. whose job is to take meaning away remember that you also have to give meaning to don't just take away mm. so if you are going to take somebody's religion away from them you give them something in return or don't touch it right don't take meaning away and don't not put any meaning back it's a void yes don't leave a void similarly in alternative medicine now there's a very deep conflict for me because i am somebody who's trained in allopathy in modern medicine and there are so many patients who come to me with who have taken homeopathy ayurveda hmm. i will talk to them about the disadvantages i'll talk to them about the risks but i will never tell them to don't believe in it because if they already believe in it what i will try and do is to give them an alternative and hopefully they will have enough faith in what i am in the way that i'm trying to treat them that they feel better with it correct but you cannot take faith away without replacing faith right um so that is one thing i would advise everyone to do which is to have rituals that are sacred to them mm. because it gives them a framework right yeah on the more success oriented mm-hmm. or the more um power move oriented mm-hmm. question which so many people have now yes there is holistic well being this mindfulness this consciousness but it has to go hand in hand for a lot of people with i need to rise up the corporate rank i sure. need to succeed in my career i want to buy that house i want to i want to what tips for productivity or mm. what tips for success would you give and is there anything on the neuroscience front that happens in your brain to kind of remove you from those pockets of productivity because it mm. happens it happens to all of us where you have this insane streak you know you're productive it's all clicking everything is working yeah. and then there's a lull correct so talk to me about the science behind it and what can one do to make your brain make your mindset more skewed towards the growth or the success sure. route the challenge that um, people face is uh, they look at the end product hmm. they look at successful people all around and think i want to be like that and how do i get there so they are at 0 and somebody is at 10 they want to get to 10 and they think that the distance is equal hmm. that 0 to 1 is same as 1 to 2 2 to 3 but it's not so 0 to 1 is harder than 1 to 10 yeah and this people don't realize and people think that oh if 0 to 1 is this hard oh this road is too difficult let me try another road and there is there also 0 to 1 is difficult 
everything you do zero to one is difficult so this is step one understand that starting a new skill mm. and learning the basics of it and sticking with it until you've learned the basics is the hardest part yeah the second thing is money is everywhere success is everywhere because ultimately success is about giving people something they value mm. and there are two parts to it creating something of value and two is convincing people that this is valuable mm. so these are the two parts of every success story correct so the second part is marketing yeah but the first part is something that you have to create and it's all you it's all you correct so somebody who is very very good at the second part could sell something which is not that difficult but eventually only valuable things will remain hmm. no no non valuable thing will stand the test of time correct they may fool people for a year or two but test of time only valuable things will remain hmm. so you have to create something of value for that you have to be good enough to give society something that they can trust or they can value correct so whatever that is there will be a market for it if you are good enough so if you are reverse engineering it still further you have to find things that you are naturally drawn to mm. because otherwise it is like swimming against the current if you say that uh, karishma is doing this i also want to do this but you are not karishma mm. for you something else might come easier podcasting might not come easier creating content might not come easier uh, talking to people might not come easier mm. so what comes easy for you where is your natural inclination find that and then go all in hmm. that is the only way that you can fight against the natural pull of attention being you know taken Maybe away so what happens to your brain when you get distracted so there are two people in your brain let's let's forget about the spinal cord and the brain stem for a while let's talk about limbic system and prefrontal cortex hmm. there are two people in your brain at any given point of time these two people are trying to grab your attention so the prefrontal cortex says i want to sit and work i will focus the limbic system says what if your friend has tweeted something mm. or what if somebody has tagged you in some instagram post how let's see how many people have liked your last reel yeah. because that gives you that small dopamine kick correct that you want you yeah. want to chase that little happiness yeah so your limbic will just say okay look there there's a loud noise outside oh, let's sit there yeah let's ex- uh, investigate that correct um your limbic is always searching for s- temporary happiness and sudden threats mm. that's what it is which is why in the newspaper every article every newspaper headline is something scary yeah if you look at a newspaper article 90% would be scary something wrong somebody you know somebody something robbed something dramatic or something sorry. extensive yeah correct it's not like good things are not happening but bad things will draw your attention correct yeah so it keeps your attention hooked onto the newspaper long enough so your limbic system is constantly looking for that mm. even if your prefrontal cortex wants to focus your limbic is always tugging at its <laughs> come you know, here come either there yeah, yeah yeah so the way to pay attention is to create a block of time where there is nothing else that is important and this has to be conscious you have to consciously say that from 12 to 1230 the world can catch on fire i don't care my attention is on this mm. and you'll be surprised at how well this works yeah just consciously saying this out loud that i don't care let everything go to hell this is my focus this is all i'm going to do and your attention span will automatically double Stop yeah so just, just being a little stern with your limbic system is step 1 yeah and you keep on doing this and gradually it will learn yeah so even i i do this thing where i i literally you know that when a voice comes i'm like yeah. Shh. yeah like keep quiet like yeah. wait hold on like you you actually have that conversation i do it over and over again until yeah. like now it's really easy for me to like kind of just be like this is not a thought i'm entertaining yeah. only yeah. it's fine yeah the prefrontal cortex is obviously the seat of a lot of good things yes in one's life does it expand is there a way to make it expand it does expand it is and when i say expand um i don't mean that it will physically grow but the connections within the prefrontal cortex will keep on evolving and the amount of control that it has on the rest of the brain 
will keep on increasing how can one grow this well one is the way you said it by constantly saying no to the limbic system is a great exercise so for a long time i used to rebel against uh structure hmm. against discipline that if somebody says wake up at 6 why should i wake up at 6 so who are you to tell me as you grow older you realize that oh you they're not telling me they are telling me to tell my limbic system hmm. that whatever i decide is the way to do it this is a decision you yeah. have to abide correct yeah so the limbic system is a child this is what i was talking about conscious and subconscious yes. right it has to be told like yeah. you almost like dr joe dispenza did this really funny thing we was talking to it like a dog like sit correct sit yeah. i'm meditating sit. sit i don't want to check instagram i don't want to do it later correct. sit so you right. basically literally have to control it with yeah. physical not physical but like that mental chatter right yeah. like you quieten it down correct. is that the way that you form newer connections in the prefrontal cortex the prefrontal cortex needs to learn that it is possible to say no to the limbic right and the limbic needs to learn that it is possible to not go after every whim to take orders to take orders correct and it's not that we don't want the limbic yeah because we also have to remember that all the pleasures from life comes from the limbic right but in a bubble like the short term a short term correct so you create a space where the limbic can really enjoy itself but then that should not be the norm because the limbic does not have direction mm-hmm. because the limbic cannot see beyond a minute correct or two yeah it cannot see 5 years into the future so when it's like see- that short term shot correct like a dopamine hit correct yeah there is a beautiful line in uh, in mahabharata um where krishna's krishna's talking to arjun about the love of a woman hmm. okay and he says that a woman is like a flame and how you how you want her in your life will determine how your life goes so if you bring her in and you don't respect her she could become a wildfire and burn down everything mm. but if you build an altar and worship her she could become the central piece like she could become the central warmth of your whole house and your whole world is now lit and it is warm yeah i love this metaphor because that's also how the limbic system works mm. so limbic is not the enemy but if you allow it to go unchecked it can ruin everything right but if you give it that importance and if you give it that space it can give you a lot of pleasure it in a can controlled way in a controlled way correct exactly right so don't let it overpower you but know acknowledge when to, it no when to kind of yes. use it yes fantastic okay so now we're going to bust some myths okay. you are going to bust some myths mm-hmm. <laughs> i'll participate <laughs> um this is more related to what what is out there right in terms mm. of neuroscience because everybody thinks yeah. that they know but let's actually get the facts sure we only use 10% of our brain yeah that's not true that's not true no. so how much of our brain do we use so the reason the that is a problematic statement is because it assumes we know what is 100% correct we don't we don't so if you don't know what the final outcome looks like how do we calculate 10% yeah. that's not true mm. The truth is that at any given point we are using hundred percent of our brains. Hmm. It's just that what that hundred percent is will keep changing, which is what neuroplasticity is. That where you try to make the newer connections to use Correct. more parts of your. So the brain is like a biological computer. So say, iPhone one, hmm. the chip would be wired differently, and the latest iPhone, which is iPhone fifteen, uses a three nanometer chip. So the difference between iPhone one and iPhone fifteen is that the chip kept changing, hmm. right? And the reason it kept changing is because in a smaller space, more and more transistors are able to talk to each other. Hmm. That's what the brain is. I understand. So the more we learn, the more the brain evolves, the more efficient those neural connections become. Correct. So in the same area, you can do more calculations. So it's you not can... more as much about hundred as it is about how you're using the hundred percent. Exactly. Right. Okay. 
left brain people are logical right brain people are creative yeah we already spoke about this uh, nobody is an absolute left brain or right brain you need both um because logic if you think that art is not scientific or if you think that there is no science in art you'd be wrong in both Correct. terms right yeah because um, a lot of scientists are very creative mm. because you need to be creative to think of new ideas or right. new hypotheses right. and a lot of artists are very methodical they see patterns they see logic within their art like yeah. mozart has a lot of mathematical yeah. uh, in a mathematical way he has structured his compositions so there's a lot of science in art and there's a lot of art in science the better you are at both the more successful you will be the union of polarity like bring yes. more of both together correct okay the bigger the brain the smarter the person <laughs> so there is some truth to this um because size of the brain relates to uh intelligence of the animal but again more important is density brain so it's density. not about the overall size and the best example for this is ravens okay so amongst the birds ravens are considered the most intelligent why is that because they can problem solve really so you know that story of the crow taking a stone pebble and yeah huh. putting a pebbles into water, the that, yeah. the bottle and then drinking the water yeah. it's true really they okay. can do that so crows uh, so lot of animals lot of birds do have very specialized skills like building nests or finding or uh, you know travel uh, finding paths across countries like migration, continents correct yeah. migration so their cerebellum is very well well developed they can find direction very well so they are more intelligent in some ways um but specifically for ravens their brain neuron density is higher than humans wow even though the size of their brain is smaller so again it's about the chip yeah it's how well those neurons connect to each other that makes a difference that's so interesting i had no idea about that um the brain is inactive during sleep oh no yeah very false yeah um only some parts of the brain are inactive the other parts are as active or maybe more active uh, during sleep uh, it's like uh, uh, i i compare it to a school where the teachers have gone away and now all the kids are free to do whatever they want yeah. that is what sleep is correct so when you're asleep your prefrontal cortex control has gone away but your limbic system is very active and all the things that you saw throughout the day will connect to each other form new patterns new ideas memories will get stored mm -hmm. which is also why dreams can be so weird and vivid and vivid yeah because there's no control correct so there's no, nobody telling the limbic system that oh this is not possible this is not rational yeah. this is not logical so suddenly your grandmom will be on a boat of, you know with you and you'll be uh, swimming to antarctica it's yeah. random it's ideas random. will come together because it's just new connections that your brain is forming correct correct yeah how does one sleep better there's a whole field of studying called sleep hygiene uh which is half an hour before sleep and half an hour after sleep you have to think of your sleep as being bracketed by these two time spans so what you do in the half an hour before sleep is as important and what you do in the half an hour after sleep is important you create these two rituals and you make it properly and you follow it every day your sleep automatically becomes better what's the ritual um number one of course would be to avoid screens no blue light yeah yeah uh, avoid screens avoid random stimulation you can read that's not a problem but the problem with scrolling is that you are getting such an emotional roller coaster mm. random reels random tweets everything you know giving you a different kind of visualization you don't want that before sleeping it's erratic it's very erratic yeah. so you need to be gradually slowing down one doctor i was speaking to gave a very good example that imagine you are driving a car at 80 kilometers an hour and you need to park can you park when you are driving at 80 yeah you can't you can't you have to slow down so the expectation that you will scroll 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 and sleep is ridiculous because your brain is working at full speed so learn to slow down and gradually ease into your parking spot and then shut down your engine and then you will sleep 
So mm. think of sleeping as parking your car. Mm. So half an hour before sleep, get into that mode. Shut off everything. Put things for charging. Brush. Say good night. Lay down, and get into your sleeping mode. You don't have to be distracted till the point. Point of sleep. of sleep. And what about after you wake up? So after you wake up, it's again restarting. So you can't go into eighty immediately. Immediately. So have a fifteen twenty minute ritual where you are gearing up for the day, and then you can start off with your day. Like mindful. Yeah. Correct. It doesn't even have to be mindful because the word mindful is a new thing. This was normal. Yeah, just like you wake up, you don't. There weren't cell phones, so you exactly. just wake up and be. Imagine what you were doing when you were ten. Yeah. Uh, and assuming, of course, that uh, <laughs> you are not fifteen right now. <laughs> not fifteen. <laughs> so yeah. whoever is listening, yeah. so when you wake up, you you brush, you say hi to your. Whoever you are staying Same with, with yeah. you have some Get a breakfast, cup of, tea, cup of yeah. tea, talk about things. What is your plan for the day? Just do all of that. Yeah, normal, normal yeah. things. Yeah, <laughs> and not everything has to be Mind. yogic. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, guilty. Anyway, male and female brains are radically different. Oh, not radically different. No, not no, no. Radical. The differences are far lesser than the similarities. Hmm. Uh, but our brain is also wired to spot differences. Yeah. So if A painting is ninety nine percent similar, and one thing is different. You will spot that first. Hmm. So that's why we think that they are so different, but it's not. Okay, you can boost your brain with brain training games. Yes, that's true. Oh yeah, because everything that your brain learns, actually, it learns as a game. So your brain is a game. Is basically your brain trying to figure out how to do something better without the threat of Actual death. Correct. So anything that you do where you will not die is actually a game. Wow. So what are some of the games that you can suggest? Like if people wanted to, okay, let me sharpen my brain. Mm. Right. Like what are some of the things that they could do? So there are there are two aspects to this. One is the actual skill that your brain learns while playing a game, and the other is how to apply this in real life. Hmm. So a lot of people will play games. But their the transition yeah. is difficult. So, for example, Rubik's cube. Oh. Now, Rubik's cube is great because it allows you to spot patterns. It allows you to think fast. It allows you to realize that just because a problem seems unsolvable when you look at it from this way, just turn the cube, and, and you find some. You'll find some answer. new things. Yeah. Now, people will do Rubik's cube. They will be- become good at it. But when they are facing a problem in their relationship, they are not kind able to apply those same skills. Yeah. So these are two separate things. Right. Uh, so you have to learn both. Correct. Now, how do you turn this problem in a different way and solve it from a different angle? That is something you have to learn separately. Okay. You can catch up on the sleep over the weekend. No, you can't. So this is a very common myth about sleep debt. Yeah, that that I'll, I'll just for, sleep for like twelve, fifteen hours. Only. Correct. Yeah, and the reason this doesn't work is because of sleep cycles. So each sleep cycle has certain takes a certain amount of time, which is around sixty to ninety minutes. So let's say it takes sixty minutes for the ease of conversation, and you need four sleep cycles, four to five sleep cycles for your brain to recover from that day's effort. Oh. Okay. So actually, no, it's ninety minutes. So Minimum of six hours is what you should have. Hmm. If you don't have that, then those toxins will not get cleared out of your brain, and those ideas will not get consolidated as memories. Hmm. So a lot of things, a lot of damage is already done. Uh, so even if you sleep for twelve hours later, you can't recover. Like exactly, the damage is already done. Make it a pattern. Correct. And you said six hours is a good time on average. On average, yes. Okay. Dietary supplements can replace a balanced diet. No, that's not. Those are almost like um, two different ways of saying the same thing. The concept of diet and dietary supplements are to the body doesn't make a difference. Hmm. The body just cares about getting enough nutrition. Correct. Right. So it, as long as it gets enough carbohydrates, enough proteins, enough fats, enough. uh minerals enough uh, nutrients it's good. it's good the problem is we don't take into account the pleasure of eating mm. 
Yeah. So let's not take that away completely because anticipation of food helps in digestion. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking forward to, to the food meal, that you're yeah. eating, if you're looking forward to a meal, if you're eating in a pleasurable way, if you're eating with community, if you're eating with people that you like, then you will digest better mm -hmm. and your overall mood improves. Yeah. So popping pills that has all the ingredients will not be a substitute for a good meal. Correct. So let's not completely become robots. Yeah, <laughs> can't do that. Yes. That brings us to the end. I have a last question. Okay. So we've had so many discussions on science, spirituality, wellness. Mm. There's, there's a lot to unpack in terms of information. But if you had to simplify one piece of advice for just holistic well-being of mm. our audience who's watching and who want to kind of live that lifestyle now right upgrade yeah. it a little bit become a little bit more spiritual maybe become a little bit healthier be cognizant of their thoughts yeah. what would your advice be the problem with uh, giving advice is um, that the answers are ridiculously simple and anything simple tends to get looked down upon today because we believe in the power of complexity. We believe that, oh, th there has to be a complex way to solve this problem. That's the only way that I will believe this works. The, the truth is that if you have, if you have your fundamental safety taken care of, which is you have people that you can trust, people that you can rely on. If, you have something that you are passionate about mm. and you find your purpose in doing that, everything else falls into place. Mm. The reason that most people struggle is because one of these two things is not in place. Either their essential safety is not, they don't feel safe, mm. which makes them want to turn towards fleeting sources of happiness or comfort or that they haven't found their their calling what do they want to do with their time mm. this should be the highest priority spirituality mindfulness um, understanding the true nature of the universe none of these are priorities all of these are emergent learnings that come from life you don't have to put in effort for this you don't have to try specifically for this. All of those will come. But if your these two core things are not in place, I believe nothing else will come. Thanks. So if you turn towards spirituality as a way of substituting that in place of these two things, I don't believe that that is the way to do it. I believe that spirituality is an outcome of a life well lived correct and not an outcome in itself so that's what i would want people to try very interesting and would make for a much larger conversation we'll definitely do this again yeah. because there's so much left to talk about but thank you so much for being here and uh, i hope that this helps people realign thank you for having me this was a lovely conversation thank you so much Thanks. we hope this episode added value to your lives Join the Realign movement, like, share and subscribe to our channel and we'll see you in the next one.